When the little light starts flashing, when the little thing goes beep, when the little light goes clink, 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 that's the time for you to speak. Bum. Stan, what have you been up What's to? What's up, Marshall? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm excited. What are you excited about? We're about to launch Proco 2.0. Now, Proco 2.0 is something you've been planning for a few years. This is pretty exciting. Tell me. A few years. Yeah, it's been a long time. Um, yeah, it's, it's the new platform. It's the new website we've been working on for a very long time. We got a whole bunch of stuff planned to promote it. We got a lot of awesome guest instructors, guest artists that are going to be making videos, doing live streams, answering questions, just a bunch of stuff. We're, we're going to announce it all soon on social media. So, follow, follow and we'll, you'll, you'll be in the loop. But yeah, lots of cool stuff. This has involved you and your time in the last few years, but also in the last week. So, you haven't had much time to read, have you? No. <laughs> no, I haven't been reading. <laughs> Why don't you ask me what I've been doing? Mm. Have you been doing stuff? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I forgot that the world exists. I have been reading one book. This is the second time reading it. I read it in January. It took me three weeks to read it the first time. It's Hitmakers, The Science of Popularity in an Age of Distraction by Derek Thompson. The Science of Popularity. What kind of popular are we talking about? Like, like I want to be a popular kid in school? No. This is popularity <laughs> in the world market of the internet ah. and mass media. Okay. So, popularity of a product or service that you're providing. That's correct. And okay. it was recommended to me by a successful man who said, you need this. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, I read it and I really enjoyed it. And, and felt like it was worth reading again. So, I tried to read it in one week for the second time and I, and I actually liked it better the second time because it is dense. In fact, well, let me tell you, let me, this is going to be a book report on Hitmakers. Yeah. Okay. This episode. I want to hear it. In the world right now, it is an age of distraction. It is an age of a million, many millions of people trying to get attention. And how can your voice stand out in a world of distraction? This is a responsible journalist. Derek Thompson uh, was editor for the Atlantic Monthly for a number of years. He was born around 1986, I think. So, he's about your age and he has studied this and done his best to humbly bring it down to some scientific observations about how hits happen. So, it's very okay. useful for people going into the arts because what could be harder than going into the arts? This is a way to look right. at some data and interpret it. <laughs> yeah, I guess you could you can consider art as being a hit or even just an artist being a hit. Yes. Right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Cool. I'm excited to hear about this. I want to know what angle this is going to all going to come from. This, this, this could go in many directions here. <laughs> right now, my anxiety is this. I want to yeah. just, I want to read the whole book to you. It was... <laughs> oh, it's really good. So, you loved it. Here's how Derek Thompson breaks it down. He has the book yeah. in two parts. The first part is what people like, how the human mind works, what kind of universal desires people have. There's some surprises about that. The second part of the book is how product gets through market to user. So, that's the big double breakup is what is it that people want and how do they get it so that if you are a person trying to sell something, uh, you know something about the business of it. Now, the introduction is so densely and well written that the introduction to the book is worth the price of the book itself. Huh. In the introduction, he starts with two metaphors. One is from uh, Italo Calvino in a book called Invisible Cities, where he explains that there is no 
one stone that makes the bridge hold up. It is the invisible in alignment of the stones that makes the bridge hold up. So if anybody is saying, what is the one factor that makes a popular hit? There is no one factor. There is an invisible coming together of several things. The second image he proposes is from Jorge Luis Borges, who talks about a map that in trying to be accurate has to be as big as the empire. And if the map is as big as the empire, it's useless. You might as well explore the empire. Now, between those two images, he presents this as a map that will help us get our heads around how uh, hits happen. It's not the real thing, it's theory. But he also tries to provide some good stones for the bridge. And the good stones for the bridge are stories. This book is replete with stories about how hits have happened, starting all the way back from 150 years ago with Brahms' Lullaby, the most known tune in the history of the human race, apparently, and how it became a hit before there was radio. And then he goes to the Impressionists, and how the Impressionists, who might not have been a hit, became a hit. And then when he moves into the 20th century, where we have mass communication, he starts to make comparisons of what happened long before mass media. And now that we've got things like Instagram, where everything goes viral, and he's looking for common ground between these two eras of how this stuff happens. I've spent the last week in this book immersed in it and tempted to share every story in there because every story in there is interesting. And every story in there is thought-provoking and discussion-prompting and inspiring. And I have to back off on that, but there's where we start. I don't want to hear all these stories. That's going to take much longer. I want to hear what lessons you learned from this book. I've got an idea for how to present this. Let me read you okay. the table of contents slowly. And that way, we can see <laughs> whether, any the of these, whether any of these are worth unpacking. Uh, okay. Introduction is the song that conquered the world. Let me tell you about this. It's Brahms Lullaby. <laughs> Brahms wrote all sorts of wonderful piano pieces, little in intermezzos and stuff. He followed right after Beethoven. He was a known composer and a respected composer, but he wrote a lullaby for a particular woman for her particular baby, and it went, as people say, viral. And the reason it went viral is for something nobody could have predicted. It was that Germany was ravished by war in the late 19th century, and German immigrants came to other countries, including the United States, and they brought with them this tune that they knew, and it just disseminated from family to family. And the point that he makes about this, there's a few points about it, but one of them is that you can't predict what the weather is going to be in two weeks or two months or two years from now. There are too many factors involved. And so that immediately introduces the element of humility. We cannot engineer with any guarantee that something is going to be hit, a hit because too many factors are out of our control. Okay. <laughs> that doesn't interest me. <laughs> okay, cool. Now what? That wasn't interesting. How does this... Pro did, did, <laughs> what? Did you say that wasn't interesting? No, it's interesting, but it doesn't serve me any good to know that. How, what do I do now with it? How, I mean, if, if I were to read this book, I would want to know how can I control, how can I increase my odds of making a hit? Not just to know that like, well, it's about luck. <laughs> that doesn't serve me any good. Here's what you do with it. You go in with a realistic attitude that not okay. all factors are in my control. Yeah, that's obvious. Let's move on. <laughs> the first chapter is the power of exposure. Here's what you get out of it. Quality is a factor in hits, but it is not the most important factor. A more important factor is exposure. And so you can make a Punnett square. You can say in one corner, we have great quality and nobody knows about it, so it can never become a hit. We have in another corner, great quality that becomes a hit because people know about it. 
Then in another corner, we have lousy quality that disappears because it should, but we can also <laughs> yeah. have lousy quality that becomes a hit, as you know, because you gripe about stuff that became a hit that you think sucks. So there are four different corners of this. <laughs> and one of the points he makes is that if people don't know about it, it's not going to become a hit. And uh, that is the power of exposure. Wait, so hold on with that. So you said that something that sucks could become well known because it sucks. What if it's in the middle? What if it's mediocre? Are people still going to talk about how much it sucks or or does that the medium stuff tend to disappear more often? Uh, or does that not matter in this in this at all? It's it's more about like if you got exposure, quality doesn't really matter because you got exposure. Uh, it's not the quality doesn't really matter. Well, but yeah, of course, it matters. The two combined are more powerful, but like you could still get have a hit w whether it's good or not. Yeah. Or in the middle. It's not that your 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 thing has to be really good or really bad. No. <laughs> no. The the Punnett square is like a map. It's an oversimplification, but it's a useful oversimplification. And the point of it is that the impressionists might have fallen into obscurity if it had not been for one member of the group whose name you don't even know, Gustav Kayabate, if I'm I might not even know how to pronounce it, but he was the one who bought up a number of these paintings that were not famous at the time, bequeathed them to the French government, and it turned into a controversy in which the painter Jerome uh, doesn't end up looking good. He called them something like filth. And it was so <laughs> it was so controversial that it aroused more curiosity. More people went to see it. And the proof that exposure was part of it was research that he cites in the book about how if you substitute the famous Impressionist paintings for other paintings and get art students who have not been exposed to the Impressionist paintings, get them more familiar with other paintings, they will prefer what they are more familiar with. So a big part of exposure is familiarity. That if mm. this is already a part of your family ritual, if you've already seen it in the art history books, if you've already been exposed to it repeatedly, you feel like it's a family member and you're okay with it and you like it better. So familiarity is part of this power of exposure thing. Okay. I don't know whether I answered your objection or your challenge. I, I get it. I understand the, the, the angle at which he's, you know, coming at this from why exposure matters. Okay. Let me go to the next chapter. The Maya rule. Maya is M-A-Y-A. -A. It's a strange thing. It means most advanced yet acceptable, most advanced yet achievable, most advanced yet accessible. Uh, but it came as a conscious philosophy from a graphic designer who came to New York right after the flu epidemic had ravaged so much of the world. And he was amazed at New York around 1920 that there were all this, all this technology, all these gadgets, but how ugly it all was. And he had a vision to make it beautiful. His name was Raymond Lowy. And he got a job as a graphic designer in New York, an industrial designer in New York, and he was so talented at making ugly things look beautiful that he ended up becoming the person who designed locomotives and washing machines and mimeograph machines and then graphic design and then everything to try to make the 20th century look more beautiful. And that's what he did. And he had a philosophy about it was that push the envelope, make it the most advanced it can be, even a little shocking, even a little startling, but something that people recognize. Does the look of a thing really make any difference? I mean, does it matter to <coughs> consumers? I think the best way to answer that is at a dinner party here in Palm Springs about uh, two years ago, I was sitting next to a charming uh, lady who uh, said, uh, slowly, you are a designer. Yes. I understand you designed the Exxon sign, but why did you design it that way, with two X's? 
I say, why? Why do you ask me? Because I couldn't help notice it. Well, say, that's the answer. When you design a sign, it's to attract attention. And I attracted your attention. And that chapter alone is great hmm. for an artist who is figuring, what am I going to do that isn't just rehashing what everybody else is doing? What am I going to do that's pushing the edge? But he also believed in going back to old things. In fact, he used nature and he used the egg as much as possible and also streamlining that happens in nature as design motifs so that he was combining the old and the archaic with what he felt was the new and the new needs. Now, that's the Maya rule, most advanced yet acceptable. Okay, I, I think when, when you first said it, I misunderstood what y the word advanced means. I think now I understand that it means the most advanced forward, changing whatever it is now to yeah. something better as much as possible, but not too far that it's now like unacceptable to the, to the public because it's just so different. The whole basis is what do people like? And it can be boiled down to people like things that are familiar, but not too familiar. They don't want to see the same thing over and over. People like things that are new, but not too new. The evolutionary theory behind it is that if you recognize it, it hasn't killed you yet. Mm -hmm. This is safe. This is part of my family. But it will also bore you unless it's got some surprise in it. Yeah. That's what the whole first half of the book shows, is that this balance between what people already know and between what people don't know but arouses their curiosity and even maybe threatens them a little bit. The benign violation, the thing that says, ooh, whoa, that's, what is that? I'm not sure if I like that and say, oh, I know who you are. This is a great big abstract theory encompassing what people like. And here's one of the things I love about the first half of the book. Derek Thompson takes that abstract theory and then applies it to one discipline, painting, uh, graphic design, industrial design, uh, music, and shows example after example about how this balance is a part of hits. The next one is The Myth-Making Mind, Part 1, The Force of Story, and it's about how George Lucas succeeded in making the most profitable big fantasy franchise because he was trying to do Flash Gordon, but he couldn't get the rights to Flash Gordon, so he just had to make up his own franchise, and he did the Star Wars universe. <laughs> and he just settled. He settled on Star Wars. Instead. He settled on Star Wars. <laughs> uh, Derek Thompson also points out that Flash Gordon had the same problem. I think it was with John Carter on Mars, which was the, the guy who'd invented Tarzan, Edgar Rice Burroughs, also had John Carter. And I think the inventor of Flash Gordon had tried to do John Carter on Mars, but couldn't get the rights to that, so ended up having to make up Flash Gordon. So we've That's got awesome. this thing of, I want to do uh, Little Nemo in Slumberland or, or whatever else, but if something is already owned by someone else, it can be used as a springboard or a touchstone to create your own individual universe, and then it has familiarity. People recognized Star Wars, whether they knew it or not, because of, for a number of reasons. But one was that those serial yeah. movies on Saturdays that had cliffhangers at the end would keep you going. And that was one of the many influences on George Lucas. So if you've got something that's already been part of the culture, even distantly, but it's part of the collective unconscious, we'll say, and then you put a new spin on it, that was the lesson. Yeah. That was one lesson out of many lessons of Myth Makers 1. Yeah, it's like if you have a, a format for a type of show, like a soap opera is familiar. No matter which soap opera you watch, it's got these things that every soap opera has. Yeah. Right? You know, so yeah, that, that's the familiarity and then you put your own story into it. You know, they, they have, you know, they cheated on their spouse in a different way. <laughs> My view of it is, is that every cliche was at some point fresh. And therefore, if we're going to, instead of just excoriating cliches, which is easy to do because we get bored with something that's cliche, 
to look at it and say, what is it tapping into? What kind of archetype mm -hmm. that brought it to the point of where it was even there in the first place? And for a student who has a luxury of a year or four to seek what they're going to do for their IP, that would be a worthwhile thing to do. What is it that made this popular in the first place? Now that it's gotten stale, how do I tap into the same energy but make it fresh? What else, Marshall? Teach me. Teach me how to make a hit. Oh, Stan, <laughs> let us I'm not just, let us I'm not just, just grab the low hanging fruit. Let us <laughs> okay. assess the tree and consider. We we're gonna extract some lessons from this. And consider every leaf. Uh, and <laughs> consider the microorganisms. Okay. Okay. The next one is the birth of fashion. This chapter was the one that upset me the most. This one is the one about how <laughs> there didn't used to yes. be something like fashion. People dressed the same way for eons. Uh, people named their children the way people named their children and you had a few uh, choices of names. And then when mass <laughs> media comes in, everything that is in becomes out and he makes a caricature of that and it's something that can be very bothersome. Uh, to some of us, because what is hot right now, everybody's going to say, oh, that, that just sucks. And what people don't like right now, later they're going to embrace and say, isn't this cool? And that's always been something that's, that's bothered me for whatever reason. The interlude after the birth of fashion and how fashions are manufactured and how they are an industry is what he calls a brief history of teenagers. Even the category of teenagers is sort of an unknown phenomenon oh, historically. It was in the 20th century that the idea of this spread out gap between childhood and, and adulthood was given a label and then turned into a, a marketing arena. And he gives a, a brief history of teens and how that affects hits because it is true that Teens will have the discretionary income. Teens will have the, they are not uh, neophobic. They are neophilic. That is, they are interested in what is not my parents' opinions. They are interested in what is our generation's branding, our trademarks. And so they're a very important market for how hits happen. Yeah. We can't, when we get specific, say that everybody likes this thing. We can say people like things that give them a sense of belonging, people like, like the things that give them a sense of adventure, but a sense of adventure, to some people, when they look at superhero movies, they can't stand that kind of sense of adventure. So the great big maxim of familiarity and newness is a big abstract maxim. When you start to get down to individuals, it becomes very specific. This group of individuals likes this specific thing. This group of individuals likes this specific thing. And that's why research is necessary to this. Otherwise, you're just aiming out at the atmosphere, hoping to hit something. Whereas when a person takes the time to research their audience and understand their audience, not to just give them what they say they want, but to understand them and see what is behind what they say they want. That is a worthy charge to the person who is seeking to make hits, is to know the audience because every audience is different. Yeah, so don't, don't just listen to what they say they want. Understand them deeper than they understand themselves so that you know what they actually want, not what they say they want. This is pretty much kind of what Steve Jobs did, Pe you know, right? Like people would say they want all these little features, but he's like, no, you don't. <laughs> this is what you want. That's and then right. it's like, yeah, that's right. That is what I want. <laughs> that's where the second half of the book gets exciting is that this first half is to understand the product and, the mar and, and your audience, and then he's going to segue into something that is exactly, he uses Steve Jobs as an, as an example. And uh, mm -hmm. it is 
that I know what we really want. I'm a part of you. I understand this group. I am a potential audience member. I mean, there's also things that people say they want, but they actually they don't actually want that thing. There's a lot of examples that come up with just graphic design, like making a website. People say, I want this feature, I want this feature. And then if you just keep listening to what people say they want, you get a horribly designed website I know. that's just filled with features. And people don't actually want all these features. They want something that is easy to understand as soon as you look at the page. And some feature requests come in and it's like, no, no, you don't want that. You want something different, something that solves your problem, but not in such an, uh, in the way that you described it. Yeah. Right? So, really, it's like, when people say they want something, they usually say it in, they usually come up with the solution and say, this is what I want, I want the solution. But what you need to do is think about what's the problem they're trying to solve? What's the pain point that they're trying to solve with the solution that they're presenting? Yes. And then solve it in a better way. Yes. In yes. a more elegant way. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that is, if you think about it, that takes insight, it takes intuition. It takes giving it some thought, but it also, it takes a creative person that, that might not even give it thought, but they're just in touch with what they want. Hey, I've got an example, not from Derek Thompson, but from one of the great courses that I've talked about quite a bit uh, and that I even did an ad for. It was the Thomas Shippey uh, Heroes and Legends course. Because when you look at these 24 lectures, he is taking characters from literature who have all of them have transcended their generation, uh, except Harry Potter maybe hasn't yet, and Uncle Tom, of course, uh, didn't. But the interesting thing about these, and Thomas Shippey makes this point consciously in, in the course, that a great character that is going to stick with people and make a difference, uh, a hit character, is not a character that everybody's asking for, it's a character that people want, but they don't yet know they want it. So, who has to know that they want it? But the storyteller. The storyteller feels like, I need to invent this Frodo Baggins, Bilbo Baggins. I knew it, need to invent Harry Potter. I need to invent Beowulf. And the reason they need to invent it is to scratch some internal itch, to satisfy some internal emotional or even spiritual hunger that I need this character. And so, the storytellers who are in touch with that, both by having a hand in an investment in their culture, but also a, an investment in their own emotional uh, life, is going to be able to bridge that gap. So, again, we're looking at how do creative people come up with things that everybody else says, I didn't know I wanted that till you showed it to me. And the first half of this book is both a big abstract maxim, they want familiarity but they want newness, but it is also look to your specifics, whether it's music or storytelling or fashion or graphic design, look to your specific disciplines and the history of it and what you feel is missing. A good deal of it is, is responding to internal unhappiness about what's already available, griping about what you don't have access to in the popular culture and that you wish you did and you may be able to contribute it. Yeah, in the business world, they just say identifying the pain points, customer's pain points. That's good. Identifying the pain point. Where do you feel the pain? Yeah. How can I make this pain go away? <laughs> We're done with the first half of the book. The second half of the book is called Popularity and the Market. Popularity in the market is about how it gets to people. And my favorite chapter of the book is the first of that batch called Rock and Roll and Randomness. And it's about how Bill Haley and his rock and roll hit, Rock Around the Clock, became one of the greatest selling hits in the history of pop music. Bill Haley was a musician in the US who was trying to get his band together. He had disadvantages. His career just wouldn't take. And then he got a record deal and he did a record that was just awful but that he was sort of forced to do and the flip side of it had a song that he wanted to record called Rock Around the Clock. And it came out and it was not a hit. It got some radio airplay and it disappeared. And then 
by luck, the son of a movie star in Beverly Hills who collected this kind of music. His dad was working on a movie. They wanted to have some music in there. They knew that this movie star's kid liked music. They asked him for suggestions. He suggested the B-side of this record. They opened up the movie Blackboard Jungle with Rock Around the Clock, and it so appealed to teenagers that it went crazy for popularity. And the role of luck in this story could be discouraging because what it means yeah. is no matter how you try, you do not know how this will happen. But here's the lesson that Derek Thompson brings out of it. Creative people who succeed are the ones who have enough tenacity. They stick with it to where the failure after the failure after the failure does not stop them. When I read about Bill Haley and see how he didn't give up, he's like one of those little wind-up toys that will never go off the edge because as soon as it hits the edge, it just turns around and goes the other way and tries again, and it doesn't seem to get discouraged. And therefore, the people who are likely to have hits are the ones who are in it for the long haul and will accept the 100 failures for the one hit. In fact, there was a guy that Derek Thompson went after who was not big on doing a book called Hitmakers because he doesn't like these pat formulas for how you're going to simplify it that anybody can make a hit. But Derek Thompson consulted with this guy and he showed that a great deal of how you use math is that if you give something a one in 100 chance that it will take and go out to everybody else, there's Good chance that if you give it a hundred chances, if you give it many chances, it's going to take. But what it takes more than anything else is perseverance, is keeping at it and not giving up. And Bill Haley, the reason I love the chapter so much is Bill Haley is a role model and an example of a guy who had things going against him who happened to succeed after his failures. Nice. Yeah, that's a lot more useful than just saying it's about luck. That I like that. Okay. Another thing though about every failure. So let's say the first thing you try something, the first thing you put, the first product you put out, or the first painting you put out, or whatever. Um, yeah, the, the chances of that one might be one in a hundred, but then you're going to learn from it, and then the next one's going to be a high, the higher odds. Because one, you're, you're going to know more people, you're going to be more well connected, you're going to be better at what you do, and you're going to know the industry you're in a little bit better. You're going to know your audience a little bit better. So, the next one is going to be one out of 90. And then the next one's going to be one out of 50. And then you're going to get to the point where everything you put out is a hit because you're one out of one. You know, because you just know the industry so well, you're so connected to the, everybody in the industry, it's just like guaranteed you're going to do successful stuff. Okay, you're anticipating something he brings up later in the book, which is John Boyd's Boom! Uda. Uh, Boom. Let, me, let me tell you about Uda. This is an inter interlude toward the end. Uda? Uda? It's O-O-D-A. It means observation, nice. orientation, decision, action. Now, let me tell you what okay. this comes from. Don Lagerberg, who is a student of military strategies, told me about it just this last year. It is for training dogfight pilots. And John mm -hmm. Boyd came up with this observation that it doesn't make any difference how brilliant your strategy is when you go in. The more important thing is the ability to change strategy quickly. That is, mm -hmm. when you are in midair and things don't turn out the way you want them to turn out, how quickly can you give up your previous strategy and find a new way to think on your feet, as they say? Steven yeah. Spielberg, in directing television, said how important it was for him because television was not what he wanted to direct. He wanted to do films where he could plan it all out. But he said that directing those episodes of Columbo and, and Night Gallery and that kind of thing, that he said, television taught me how to think on my feet because you've got really tight schedules, not time for rehearsal. You've just got to do it. So, OODA is observe, orient, Decide, take action, and then do it again and again and again. And that habit will serve you better for your failure. And then go into UDA. Fail again, go into UDA. And the person who is able to do that as a matter of habit is more likely to win the, win the battle. Somehow this is also connected to 
the idea that I think we talked about last time or the time before that of principle-based learning versus technique-based learning. Remind me. Principles are rules that never change, whereas techniques are things that, you know, only work under specific circumstances. And so, if you understand principles, you can adapt your technique or exactly what you're doing to these rules that just don't change. Um, but a technique, if something changes, you're dying, it, it, you're, you're going to fail. Yeah. So, if you go into dog fighting with a specific maneuver you're, you, you're planning on doing, but then something changes all of a sudden and this, this maneuver is just not going to work, yeah. right? The circumstances just are not ideal for it and you don't understand the principles behind all of these maneuvers, you can't come up with a new one on the spot because you just got this like maneuver d memorized and you're just going to do it and fail. Yes. You know, the maneuver is the technique and the principles are the things that, you know, these techniques are based on of why they work in the first place. Here's a chapter that the whole time I was reading it, I knew you were going to love. Oh, all, right, all right. All right. It's called The Viral Myth in which he uses okay. 50 Shades of Grey as an example. And here's the thing. <laughs> oh, God. Things don't go viral on the internet. Okay. That's his audacious claim. And his point is that what looks like it would go viral that virus means one person has the flu, then two people get it, then four people get it, then eight people get it, and it goes viral. And he said, that made sense before we studied the actual facts, which is that everything can be traced on the internet about how it happened. And he makes a pretty audacious claim and a pretty strong claim. Things don't go viral. There's a, it's not the right metaphor. That there has to be broadcast diffusion. That is, instead of one person affecting another who affects another who affects another, apparently the statistics show, no, there's one person or one company affecting thousands or millions. So, when you say something went viral because it was on the Super Bowl commercial, it didn't go viral. It was a broadcast that got everybody talking about it that day or in the, in the following weeks. And he makes a pretty good argument for this, that in order for something to quote go viral, it will either have a visible broadcast like the Super Bowl where you can say that's how it happened or, and this was the case with that book, Fifty Shades of Grey, a dark broadcast where there was a community of people of fan fiction people and a writer's club where somebody got popular among their peers and then that led to the next step and then that led to the next step and then it led to this huge marketing blitz. And one of the things he points out in this is that popularity is a big deal in marketing, that there were all sorts of people who read that book even though they weren't interested in it, but it was their ticket to social acceptance like the crowded club that people want into because it's crowded. So, that's a huge part of what makes things popular is that the desire to belong to this culture right now, everybody else cares about it, I want to fit in, I will care about it, and that, that sold another several gazillion books. So, I think I understand that the thing about, you know, one really popular post person notices it promotes it and then boom, the thing is viral. I think, I guess that makes sense. That actually kind of happened with, with my very first YouTube video. Tell us. I had some people who were following my blog at the time who were pretty well-known artists and they had a lot of followers on Facebook. And when I launched my video, I promoted it. It, it started getting a lot of views from day one because like two specific artists that had a lot of followers on Facebook, shared my Facebook post and then like that reached their audience and it blew up. Yeah. So, that, that makes sense. Without those two people, it really wouldn't have gone viral. It's not like it slowly would keep spreading in the same way. It would have spread and then diffused and then that's it. Yeah. But there have to be these two specific players in the thing that just like exploded out to, to way more people. Yeah. Here's something that he used as an example. It was bowling pins. That you 
cannot expect to knock down all the bowling pins by just nicking the side of one of them. If you're going to get a strike, it's probably going to be with the bowling pin right there in the center. And he used the example of explosions, as you mentioned. Uh, you could say that there's a lot of booster shots in there, that you had two people who already had an audience. And so that leads into his next chapter, which is the audience of my audience. That how can I appeal not just to my audience, which might just be 10 people, but what if of those 10 people, one of them has an audience of a thousand people? Now, if they like it enough to share it with their audience, and then any one of those thousand people has an audience of 10,000 people. So he encourages to put energy into who is the audience of my audience. And how would this make one of these people want to share it with their audience? Now we're getting real mm -hmm. practical about marketing. Okay, the next one. What the people want, one, the economics of prophecy. What it means is he uses the example of Cassandra. Cassandra is the daughter of the king and queen of Troy, and she has a gift of seeing the future, but she has the curse of not being believed. Cassandra could do well with the stock market. Wouldn't make any difference whether people believe her or not. She knows what to invest in. And so this was the principle of when other people zag, zig. If everybody says that's the thing to invest in, this is the real estate market, this is the thing to do. If everybody's doing that, I know of some creative people that have been very successful, one of whose philosophy is consciously, when others zag, zig. Look at what they are not doing, and then people start to get hungry for that. How is that related to if like being someone that could see the future, but nobody believes you and the stock market is something that works for you? George Lucas is an example. Is that at the time he came out with Star Wars, that was one of the worst ideas you could come out with, partly because uh, serial adventure stories were out, science fiction had become kind of categorized as cheesy, uh, science fiction movies for the most part, when you look, other than a few exceptions, like Kubrick, uh, it was not the thing to do to meet the market. But it was one of those things that I want to see this, I want to do this, I'm young enough hot enough, able to know how to make a movie. He was doing something differently than what other people were doing. So how is that, how is that, like what was his stock market then? I'm trying to understand how the this, this stock market thing is, is important here. Like nobody believes me, I'm doing something different, but I can still make it work because I got the stock market where people don't matter. How, how is this related? Is that if you know that that stock's going to go up, and nobody else believes that it is, you're in the best position. And if you as a creator of content have an intuition, everybody's doing this, I would rather do this. I feel like this is the thing that I want. That's a hunch, can't be guaranteed, but it's a hunch. And that is what George Lucas did by choosing to do a genre that was not happening at the time. And as soon as it succeeded, then everything starts imitating that. He uses Seinfeld as an example also. Seinfeld was a sitcom that went against the grain of what people were used to in a sitcom. And here is one of the great lessons from this economics of prophecy. At the time, there was a t another TV show called Cheers uh, along with uh, Seinfeld that their first seasons did not succeed, but their networks their producers were okay with that because they felt like they had a good product. And then later when they succeeded, they succeeded way out of proportion of anything that was successful previous to them. Now, Alice Cooper, I'm told in his autobiography, pointed this out that in the 1970s, the great bands, Pink Floyd, Led Zeppelin, Deep Purple, Black Sabbath, Alice Cooper, Emerson Lake and Palmer, you can just go down the list of all of the biggest hit bands their first albums were not successful. It took the second or third one for it to take. And Alice Cooper was lamenting the fact that by the time the 1990s and the 2000s come around, record labels don't give you a chance if your first album doesn't work. But 
What Derek Thompson complimented the executives at HBO or one example for, for one of the shows, what he uh, complimented is that they were investing in talent more than simply in product. That they knew these people were good and it might take time for them to get it going, but if they get it going, we're all going to be rewarded. And they did. So there was a hunch that this is a good show, even if it's not like other shows, it just needs a little time to catch on. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, I'm curious how people that have this hunch get the hunch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Does he go into that at all? Is it really just about zigging when others are zagging? Or is there some clues that they see that are happening on like in an area where most people are not observing and you start you're starting to see movement in a direction and then you say oh things are headed that way yeah and there more people are going to head that way let's go there now before everybody goes yeah or is it really everyone's there no one's there i'm going to go over there <laughs> that doesn't work that, that thing where everybody's going over there, so I'm going to go over there just for its own sake, it may be that you're, a person's missing it. Here is why I appreciated Derek Thompson's humility. You cannot read this book and be guaranteed a hit in any way. This is a way to look at how hits have happened. That's where the hunch comes, is here's what I'm doing, here's what I'm trying to do, here's what the people around me are trying to do. Here's what's popular right now. Here's what I wish would be popular. And then to a creative person, they will, in taking the time with this book, I think it's great inspiration for saying, I'm not going to do this just because other people aren't, but I really do sense that this is what people want. It's filled with stories. I've got my own stories. Rod Serling's Twilight Zone was such a hit and, and who would have known that it was going to be because he had that gift of what's going on in the culture right now with the social paranoia at the time to create a TV show that would tap into that. So the hunch, the hunch is what we call creativity. Some people will be better at it than other people. And, uh, and, and, and so we're, we're going to learn from them. And Derek Thompson has given us this layout of dozens of creative people and shown us how they did it so that we can pick up their vibe and be like them. Yeah. So I think the the quote or the saying, when others zag, you zig, it might be a little oversimplified and misleading to some. I know. That maybe we should add on a little <laughs> a half sentence on that and say, when others zag, you zig, but only when you sense people want to zig. <laughs> yes. And never in the book <laughs> does he use the term zig. Or zag. That came okay. from my commentary on it, which is okay. the economics of prophecy is that Cassandra knows, sees, prophesies things that the major culture can't believe. And so she had a gift. And so all of us might want to look at Cassandra and say, all right, I sense that it's going this way, even if nobody else does. That's the economics of prophecy. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Makes sense to me now. The next chapter is What the People Want, Part 2, A History of Pixels and Ink. It's about news, and it's about the balance between a journalist's responsibility to tell the truth. But if you tell the truth and people don't know your work, they're never going to know the truth, so you have to delight the reader. And he talks a little bit about how even at the beginning of, in, in New York, I think it was, that newspapers would hire private detectives who would watch what people opened the newspaper to and what they read, and they'd notice that there was a difference between what men looked at and what women looked at, and they'd find out that people cared more about pictures than words, and they'd find out that any advertisements that were below the halfway fold of the, peop uh, of the paper were less paid attention to, so they were doing research by spying on people who bought. And then later, television ratings. And then by the time internet comes out, and at the time he wrote this, Facebook was the biggest platform in the world where everybody was getting their news. There's a trail of how all of it happens, and you can follow the trail. And then he did what I thought was fortunate, another dark side of kind of a view of that, that that can be really problematic for a culture. 
that everybody's just reinforcing their own opinion, which polarizes the culture further. And he even suggested in there <laughs> briefly that Facebook might consider deliberately giving a feed that is the opposite of what people already dig in their prejudices with. But I doubt that Facebook is going to do that because it's not to their no. advantage. Remember, I think it was the last episode, I, t I told you about confirmation bias. Yes. This is exactly it. Yeah. Uh, social networks are driven by confirmation bias. They, you know, they know that when they show people things they agree with, people are more likely to engage with that. Yeah. To, to share it, so to go, yes, I like that. But if they show them stuff they don't like, they're just going to block, they're going to ignore, they're going to get mad and leave, go to another app. You know, they want to give people what they want. And so, because of that, they just keep giving people what they already, you know, the opinions they already have. Yeah. You know, people that are liberal just keep getting more liberal stuff in their feed. People who are more conservative just keep getting more conservative stuff. And it just drives people further and further away from each other to the point where we, they just don't understand each other anymore. Yeah. That to me was one of the most valuable social contributions that this book offered. I don't know that it gives that much yeah. to do with, with marketing. He refers to fluency. Fluency is when it's easy to understand an argument because you already believe that way. Uh, it's something you're familiar with. Disfluency is where you have to concentrate hard and you figure, I'm not going to concentrate this hard. It threatens what I believe already. So. The early point that he made in the book is that people seek fluency with just a tiny bit of disfluency to challenge them. This is all from the Netflix documentary, The, the, so, the Social Dilemma. <laughs> so, if, yeah, if people want to learn more about it, just Social Dilemma on Netflix. It's a cool, cool documentary. It goes into all the problems with social networks and stuff. Yeah, people might not want to know more about it because it's so disfluent to them. It means I'm going to have to think about my Facebook feed and how I'm confirming it, my own bias. It's something people should be aware of and... <laughs> it's a dose of medicine yeah. that doesn't taste good. Yeah, it, it's, it's important stuff. <laughs> the final chapter in the book is a really inspiring chapter. It's called The Future of Hits, Empire and City State. Let me explain. Empire will be Disney. City State will be Ryan Leslie. A musician. Okay. Empire is that one thing feeds into another thing, feeds into another thing, feeds into another thing, so that when you have a success like a movie, it's not just a movie, it also has a product. You can buy stuffed animals of the characters. And it's not just a product, it's a pilgrimage to a theme park. And when you go to that theme park, it reminds you that you can buy more of this product which makes you curious to see the next movie, and then the TV show that spins off from of it, and then the songs. Uh, all of this stuff loops back in so that there is this infinity loop of anything that succeeds will lead them back to my product and build an empire. But that can only be done when you've already got a strong establishment where you can make movies and TV shows and produce songs and stuffed animals and have a theme park like Disney does. So he focuses on how Disney has mastered this as, a, as, as an empire. Well, when I read that, I feel like, okay, thank you for telling me about how if I had a uh, hundred billion dollars, I could succeed. But he, <laughs> yeah. he ends with Ryan Leslie, whose story interested me and attracted me much more. This is an individual singer-songwriter who has a series of false starts at the beginning of his career, has some successes, but it's not a successful career. Then he writes a love song to a specific woman, Cassie, and then that gets known and big, but then that ends up collapsing on itself. And he eventually builds a smartphone app to keep in touch with a small audience that pays him directly and that care about what he's doing, and he makes a good deal of money from it. And this ends Wait, up- Wait, what? 
<laughs> Hold on. That's like a big... I don't, I don't get that, that last part. Okay, he builds an app. Ryan Leslie apparently built an app for a smartphone. Yeah. I don't know anything about how that works, but the whole point of it was that it kept him in touch with a small audience that cared about what he was doing and that pays him enough money to where he can make a good living. And it's not by creating a huge broadcast hit. It's more of what Peter Bagg, the comic book artist, calls narrow casting. To Ryan Leslie, it was the quality of the people that he was serving. He said, my thesis is simple. Your network is your power. And he was not about getting a bigger and bigger audience. He was about what I'm hoping to do, which is to have a smaller and smaller audience of people that you really want to be involved with and who mutually nourish and, and challenge each other. The Ryan Leslie story was a small part of the book, but he ended it on it so that after we've been exposed to this mega giant of hits, we now get exposed to somebody would say, I could do something like that maybe. Give me your thoughts. Uh, this just reminds me of um, Kevin Kelly's uh, idea of a thousand true fans. Yeah. He says that if you if you have a thousand true fans, that's really all you need. You do not need a million followers to succeed and to make a living online. Yeah. Yeah, if you have a thousand true fans that really love what you do and you have a way to connect with them and, um, you know, and they can follow you and buy your stuff, um, then yeah, that, that's all you need as an individual, you know. We might want to do some math about how many people purchase stuff on the internet, which would be in the bil many billions, and then what would a thousand be percentage-wise? Point zero zero what of that audience? <laughs> That's just, it doesn't even matter. We could say there's 20 zeros or 50 zeros. What? If we're trying to tap into some kind of universal human need, we don't have to tap into a universal human need that appeals to everybody, only this tiny percentage. And if a thousand, how much do they yeah. need to pay us? $10 a well, month? Well, let's see. Let's see. How much do you want to make per year? <laughs> Or how much does an individual artist really, you know, need to make per year to be kind of like, yeah, I'm good. If you live in Orange County, a hundred to a hundred and twenty thousand dollars a year. Uh, it's Orange County. Let, let's let's go a little bit that's more. That's if you live like, in Orange County, but let's say you you live uh, yeah, in, or the Bay Area would be worse. Uh, let's say that you need to make sixty to eighty thousand dollars a year to keep all your bills paid. Okay, let's go with eighty. That's probably more than enough for almost anywhere you live in the world. Okay, so eighty thousand dollars a year mm -hmm. divided by a thousand people. That means your true fans need to pay you eighty dollars per year, which ends up being what per month. Per per month, that's a little under, under seven dollars. So if you're selling them one product per year, you got to make sure that product is eighty dollars. If you're selling them some monthly subscription to something, then it's six dollars and sixty seven cents. Yeah. To these thousand true fans and you're making 80 grand a year. I remember when I first heard about the thousand true fans, I was very excited about it. So I was thinking students now don't have to rely on the ad agencies, the animation studios, the big companies. Yeah. They don't have to rely on it anymore. Can you get somebody to pay you $10 a month? Can you get a thousand people to do it? And uh, students that are only getting 10 or 20 people to do it are at least starting it. But then when I looked it up on the internet, there were a few people who did what is inevitable. They had to tear it apart and show it's not that simple. And I read some of what they had to say, but it doesn't change the fact that the principle is the Ryan Leslie versus the Disney phenomenon, that a person can, on their own, if they've got something that is going to appeal to enough people, have something that isn't a huge hit, it's a small hit, enough to keep them, keep their bills paid. A thousand true fans, though, I think it, it's a, it applies to a very specific product or service you're providing. It's something that has little value, right? Something that's worth $7 a month or only $80 a year. Mm -hmm. Somebody who maybe like yourself, whose service is like mentoring people or, you know, pro providing something to a smaller group of people that is worth a lot more. Doing workshops, right? Workshops to a group of 25 people every month or so, you know, like if you do that, then that math changes 
it, it becomes not a thousand true fans, but a hundred true fans who you now sell $800 a year from them. Yeah. But because this is their true fans and they really want to study with you or I mean studying that's one one thing they could do from you but um, it could also be they buy one painting from you per year that's worth $800 whatever um, it, the math changes depending on what you're offering yeah Anderson Horowitz um, has a blog post about it where he thinks nowadays online it's a lot easier to uh, to make more money from less people. And a lot of artists are doing it. I, I know people that, you know, they, they do mentorships. They charge yeah. 150 bucks an hour and people stay with them for the whole year. And yeah, like that, it's pretty easy if you're paying someone $150 an hour to reach $800 a year. <laughs> like That's like six hours or something. It's the, yeah. ex it's the exciting new paradigm. Yeah. Okay, now here's here's what toward the very last pages of the book, the kind of conclusions that we the, the conclusion we get. There is no certainty of creating a hit. Anymore, I think he used the example of you cannot predict the position of every billiard ball of 16 billiard balls by smacking it and knowing where they're going to go. You just can't know because there's too many unknown factors. But there's a quote in there: to be a maker in this world is to sacrifice certainty for love at the altar of art. Can't have certainty. Can't know that I'm going into the arts and I am going to have a career and I'm going to make good money. There is no such certainty. But there is such a thing as love of the art. And if I can justify doing this and love getting better at it, I'm going to increase the odds. That's okay if I don't get the hit. I'm still doing what I love. I like that attitude. I admire Derek Thompson. I admire this book. I would read it a third time with other people. And I felt like it was a contribution. I hope it's a hit for him. I hope he made good money from it. But it is also a contribution to people who are struggling with how do I make my way if I want to draw pictures or paint pictures or write songs or tell stories. In fact, I'm going to use this as the text for a semester of the genre class. Because in my genre class, genre is the broad definition of genre. Anything you want to do. A medium, a style, a legitimate genre that is called a genre in storytelling. And say, I want to be good at this, and I want to make my living with this, and I want to claim this arena for myself. This is the book that is worth putting one semester into and looking back and forth and discussing with others. Great. Makes me want to read the book. Oh, you'd get a lot out of it. Yeah. You're already doing a lot of this stuff. Because I'm a hit, baby. <laughs> that sounded so wrong coming out of my mouth. No, I, I'll, I'll just cheer it on. <laughs> it tasted awful. Yeah, well, well, that's probably good. That means you've got something in you. <laughs> oh, God. To restrain it. Ugh. Um, anyway, thank you, guys. Uh, we love you. Thank you for listening. Keep listening. Tell all your friends. Tell your family. Make this a hit. Especially those of you that are listening who have a lot of followers. You're the ones that are going to make this go viral. So, we're counting on you. Wait till we do a good one. Send them the best. Yeah, sure. It wasn't this one. No, That's it wasn't sure. this one. <laughs> all right. Anyway, cool. Thanks, guys. See ya. Make sure you, uh, make sure you go to Proko.com next week. Yeah, Proco 2.0 is <laughs> Lots open. Lots of big stuff going to happen. Yay! Proco 2.0. All right. Bye.